that's only the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Mm. But that's what I was deeply involved in. And back to you. <laughs> it's not back to me at all, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what's going through your <laughs> mind. Mm -hmm. Well, in mind. Any questions? That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not taking any from him. He's a troublemaker. <laughs> 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 Can I ask about Bram Stoker and vampires? You seem to suggest that he invented the idea of a vampire, but is it not a very ancient idea which he just picked up from somewhere? No, so, I'm sorry, what I meant was <coughs> he based it on the existence of the incubus and the succubus, yeah. which you, you can find in dictionary. Mm. Actually, in some dictionaries, they're actually defined as visiting people's sleeping people and actually having sex with them. Mm -hmm. <coughs> These two beings have been in existence since the dawn of recorded history. What I'm saying is that I'm sure that, it's only my opinion, but I'm sure Bram Stoker was aware of the existence of these visitations from these two entities, which still go on in the present time. Mm. Because all the symptoms that I mentioned to you, people losing their appetites, mm. sleepwalking, um, being hypnotized, being pinned to the bed, the sexual element, and people becoming anemic. The very same symptoms that apply to vampirism. So well, was he the first person to actually put a vampire into a story? No, there was a, 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 a yeah. I believe there was one, I'm not literally, mm. sorry, literally expert, I think Jones the person for that, but I was believe there was a book called Vani the Vampire before that, so he could have taken some elements off that. So it's that answer. Answer you okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd better let them ask Well, one thing, uh, you didn't go mentioning about your marriage and how you had this Catholic white wedding and then followed by a miraculous child born just one month later. Um, and so there's a few other curiosities about that marriage. Well, it's quite simple, Gareth. I got my first wife. Yes, I was actually wondering if um, you talk so <coughs> eloquently, um, sorry, that sounds really good, it's not meant to be, but you talk so eloquently about Wicca and your belief in it. I was wondering why you stopped um, adhering to that belief. That's a very important question, and I don't want to sound conceited in my answer. I was involved in it very, very deeply for so many years, 82. I really felt I'd learnt all, all, all that it could teach me. But I kept certain of the symbolism. For example, I had, had an altar in my flat with appropriate symbols on it, different kind of candles for different periods of the year. And because people used to visit, and I realised that the symbolism was still important to other people. But I really believed in some way that I just passed people beyond it. I, I no longer needed it. It was, um, <coughs> I really left it behind me, if that explains. 
explains it properly. Okay. Okay, one more question. Am I? Yes. I was wondering, how does it feel when you're known for going out and looking into what most people see as myths? How does it feel to you to have that when you've had all these people feeding stories about you and exaggerating things that have happened around you, to know that there's a part of you effectively which is a, a walking myth? When you walk into a certain place, if people recognise you, they see <coughs> that apparition rather than who you actually are. They associated me with me myself with the myth, you mean, rather than No, you you've become a myth, you've become a legend in certain respects. And in some wrong respects. I mean let's face it, yeah. pretty bad respects. But still people <laughs> it's nothing I'm not supposed to have not done. <laughs> <laughs> How do I feel? Well, I can only answer that by saying, at least I know the truth within me. I, I know what happened. Certain other people don't. No, I don't. Hayley, do you want a photo now? <laughs> now, I've got to be serious. I mean, I was being serious, sorry. Now I embarrass myself. <laughs> no, how do I feel... Obviously, it hurts me inwardly to know a lot of this isn't true uh, about sacrificing cats, about worshiping the devil, about doing this, that, or the other. I'm not trying to pretend it doesn't, I'm not aware of it. But the, on the other hand, I am aware that it's not true, so that's a season of hurt. Okay, one more question. I'm a real softie, thing. Look at her, she keeps the form. Do you want to ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I remember that paragraph in one of your books about the night when you decided to check out um, the cemetery and you said that you saw something um, from the entrance in yeah. Swain's Lake. I was just wondering if you could tell us about what you saw. I have to be quick, yeah? Did you, did you mind? I'm not... Um, He's not been flipping about this. No, really not. He's just being sensitive to people. So. Reports of a tall, dark, even with red eyes figure that was said to haunt the haunt of the cemetery about late 60s, early 70s. This f- apparition figure had been reported in Swain's name and actually inside the cemetery itself. I went to the cemetery in December 69 to try and find some logical explanation for the causation such as I thought it might, have, it might have been the moon reflecting or the wind blowing tr- tree branches in the wind casting a shadow, that sort of thing and I knew there was a way there was animals breeding in Highgate Cemetery at that time foxes actually and they're still breeding there even to this day Jim Payton had never been able to get rid of those probably oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's alright, she's not here are <laughs> anyway I went there to look for a lot of explanations. Passing the top gate, I actually saw this apparition, this figure myself. Area turned very, very cold, and it was a bitterly cold night, and I don't know what it was. But at first, I thought it was somebody dressed up. I heard local stories about vampirism, trying to scare parties by. But it, def- it definitely was not human, because it just disappeared. That's what led me to start finding and interviewing other people local witnesses who lived in the around the cemetery who actually witnessed them uh, had experiences with this alleged apparition uh, and eventually I came to put, well, to put them all down in the book different people's experiences but I wasn't the one that first saw this in fact <coughs> research revealed it been <coughs> reported back to Victorian times so yes it's true I did witness something I don't know what it was it was not human Put it down to just another unexplained phenomenon. <laughs> oh, you came yesterday, didn't you? I thought so. Now, remember your name? Martin. Martin, yes. I, I did actually remember it, yeah. Okay, I mean, we, we, could, we could go on through the night. I think I think that would be. Okay, well, I mean, there's still so plenty of time for you to, uh, to speak to David if you want to buy a book. Yeah. Um, normal price twelve ninety nine. Tonight only ten pounds. 
and is entirely self-published by David, so it would be great if you wanted to grab a copy. And uh, just to say thanks very much to Jane Watson and, of course, the wonderful David Brown. <laughs> Thanks everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to the Muswell Hill Bookshop. Did you choose that music? I did. <laughs>